You are about to see a hearing on executive branch travel practices. The House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee looked at this issue today. Republican House member Roscoe Bartlett and officials from government agencies and interest groups testified. The hearing lasts two hours and 15 minutes. This morning, we're holding a hearing which will spotlight the abuse of travel practices by senior government officials. It's come to our attention that the federal government runs what, in effect, has become a number of VIP, very important person airlines, for senior government officials. The VIP airlines are not exactly a mom and pop company. They have a budget of over $1 billion, fly nearly 2,000 planes, transport a million federal executives each year as they travel about the world doing their job. This VIP airline serves not only generals and admirals, but also presidential appointees, federal career executives, and members and staff from Congress. The cost of travel is often substantially more than the commercial alternative. On February 10, 1993, President Clinton issued a memorandum to his cabinet and agency heads and White House employees concerning restricted use of government aircraft. His goal was to rein in the cost of federal executive travel. Despite repeated Clinton administration promises to reform government as we know it, the abuse persists. This is reflected in the lack of an economy-oriented culture, a cost-conscious culture, among the executives who continue to support sometimes extravagant federal travel practices. The General Accounting Office, the Audit and Program Agency of the Congress, has identified in a series of studies it's conducted several instances of waste, fraud, and abuse by executive branch officials. Many domestic and foreign trips have been taken by executives on federally owned aircraft that duplicated commercial airline routes. The General Accounting Office, GAO, reported that the VIP Airlines fare for a Los Angeles to Washington round trip was $4,752 versus a commercial government contract fare of $396 per person. The Paris to Washington fare for 12 people was $191,630 on the VIP airlines versus a commercial fare of $41,480. Further proof of the lack of cost consciousness has been noted by the GAO. Recently, it was reported on a golf outing taken by a White House staffer on a presidential helicopter. We in Congress need to pay more attention to the need for congressional oversight and legislative action with regard to federal executive travel, especially in light of these documented episodes of rather extraordinary, in some cases bizarre, behavior. Examples of this include use of military aircraft to transport U.S. Air Force General Joseph W. Ashey, an assistant and a cat, from Italy to Colorado in September 1994. White House staff member David Watkins, use of presidential helicopters for a golfing trip. Extensive and extravagant international travel, which is in various newspapers and on the media, by the Secretary of Energy, Hazel O'Leary, and her staff. These episodes reinforce the observation there is a culture of abuse among some federal officials and their use of travel and related services. There needs to be a much better pre-approval system than would now exists. This hearing will consider senior executive travel policies, procedures, and reporting practices. These are set out in various government documents, which will be discussed by a few of today's witnesses. The documents include two from the Office of Management and Budget, part of the President's Executive Office of the President, OMB Circular A-126, dated May 22, 1992, OMB Bulletin 9311, dated April 19, 1993. There are also two key memoranda from the General Services Administration. Senior Federal Travel Reports, compiled by the General Services Administration, and Federal Property Management Regulation 101-37.4, produced by the General Services Administration. The Office of Management and Budget requires the General Services Administration, GSA, to compile senior federal travel reports, which list each trip that federal executives take. The intent of the senior federal travel report is to monitor compliance with policies and procedures concerning such senior official travel. These policies and procedures commonly ensure that taxpayers pay no more than necessary. Federal aircraft are used only for official purposes, and federal aircraft are not used if commercial aircraft service is reasonably available. 
The General Services Administration senior federal travel reports are issued twice annually. Except for the Department of Defense, GSA presumably analyzes agency's data submission to conformity to federal policy and regulation. It then transmits the results back to each agency in the President's Office of Management and Budget. The GSA report contains the name of each traveler, official purpose of the trip, departure point for each leg of the trip, destination of each leg, and the reimbursement cost, if required, of the airline involved. The GSA report must also contain the allocated federal aircraft cost and corresponding commercial aircraft cost for each leg. The GSA data are almost exclusively dependent on an agency filing. OMB Circular A-126 establishes requirement for agencies to submit data on senior federal official tra aircraft travel. The Office of Management and Budget requires agencies to submit data on federal aircraft travel by senior executive branch officials. The GSA's federal property management regulations codify these regulations in much more detail. It's worth noting that the Department of Defense has no system for tracking senior executive aircraft travel across the military services. According to various studies of military travel by the Inspector General of the Department of Defense and the General Accounting Office, the agent of Congress, duplication and waste are rampant throughout the defense establishment. Unfortunately, the federal systems backing up the existing policies and procedures have failed to change the lack of cost consciousness. The culture of air travel abuse continues. The American people are rightfully disgusted with these recurring personal adventures they read about or hear about on the evening news. Instead of just changing the faces, we need to change the practices. So some of the questions we're going to ask is why hasn't this culture changed and what can be done by the responsible executives and members of Congress to change the culture? Today we're seeking answers to those questions and options which may help change the culture and thus the basic purpose, save the taxpayers money. One answer to the problem is to reduce the number of aircraft and their availability. The White House has over a dozen helicopters and approximately two dozen aircraft at its disposal. Worldwide, the Department of Defense has over 500 aircraft set aside exclusively for use by both senior civilian and military officials. According to the General Accounting Office, fewer than 50 of these exclusive aircraft were used to ferry officials during the Gulf War. The federal civilian aircraft fleet consists of 1,596 aircraft, which are in addition to the Defense Department's 500 planes. The nearly 1,600 civilian aircraft have an annual budget of roughly $883 million going on $8 billion. Despite this level of airplane support, this near $1 billion of civilian aircraft, there are also civilian contract, charter, and rental aircraft, which cost the taxpayers an additional $200 million annually. This includes the recent rental of a previously owned MGM Grand airplane by Secretary of Energy Hazel O'Leary at the cost of $415,000 to the taxpayer. Reductions in the VIP Airlines aircraft have been suggested by the General Accounting Office, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and other observers. The Joint Chiefs have recommended a reduction of over 100 aircraft of their 500 available within the Department of Defense. Prompt action is needed to ensure significant reductions in the number of these airplanes. The cost of operating the Department of Defense portion of VIP airlines is significant. It costs on the average $380 million a year to operate. The figure is based on the average costs for fiscal year 1993 through 95. Over 500 defense aircraft carried 542,000 passengers in 1993 and 501,000 in 1994. As I noted, the President has two dozen fixed-wing aircraft and a dozen helicopters at his disposal. Uh, the uh, number of presidentially related helicopter flights, and that would include either the President, the Vice President, First Family, Staff, Cabinet, and Foreign Guests, between January 93 and May 94 was roughly 1,200. Today we're going to explore several topics. Do senior federal executives have a need to rent luxury aircraft? Are federal executive travel reporting systems providing complete and easily accessible information? What else, if anything, is needed? Should each VIP airline passengers agency assume the full cost of the flight? Should the Air Force be the single provider of operational support aircraft within the Department of Defense? Today's hearing includes several witnesses commenting on aircraft use by federal senior executives. And appearing today 
by Representative Roscoe Bartlett of Maryland, who has taken an active role in uncovering inappropriate use of White House helicopters. Mark Gebeke, an investigator at the General Accounting Office, who has reviewed VIP Airlines travel by senior federal executive officials. David Buckley, a special assistant to the Department of Defense's Inspector General, will review travel by General Joseph W. Ashey and the pattern of travel abuses within defense. David Williams, the research director for Citizens Against Government Waste, a very helpful nonprofit budget watchdog group, will comment on Secretary of Energy O'Leary's extensive travel. Uh, Peter Zeidma, Director of Aircraft Management Division at the General Services Administration, GSA, will discuss travel data compilation and systems design for the senior official travel report. Gentlemen, we thank all of you for joining us. We look forward to your testimony. I'm going to first ask uh, Mr. Davis, Mr. Scarborough, if they have an opening statement, and then we'll proceed with the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to be very, very brief in asking unanimous consent to revise and extend uh, remarks and put them in the, uh, in, the, in the record. I want to thank Chairman Horn for calling this meeting. It's uh, kind of ironic. We're here working uh, today where most of Congress is still uh, on vacation and out of town. And I applaud you for uh, continuing the work and setting an example. This is what the whole federal government ought to be doing had we been able to reach an agreement for the President. I think it's tragic uh, for the country that we continue to see the government to shut down uh, last week and this week as well. I want to thank the witnesses as well for being here today. I think what is underlying all this is the fact that there continues to be still no cost consciousness uh, with executive personnel as they use aircraft. I think that is very clear from looking at the GAO reports. I think it's going to be clear from the testimony uh, today. Uh, there seems to be a philosophy as they buy more and more aircraft that if you buy them and maintain them, they will be used. And in fact, uh, that is exactly what has happened. We are keeping so many aircraft uh, available today that it's almost irresistible for executive personnel uh, to use them. In many cases, even though it's much more expensive to use that aircraft than it would be to go commercially. I think the largest abuse has been, as I uh, take a look at the GAO report on the observations on travel by senior officials, uh, dated June 1995, that the uh, most frequent origin and destination for Army and Air Force helicopters based in Washington, D.C., is the flight from Andrews Air Force Base to the Pentagon, uh, which takes about 24 minutes if you travel it uh, by a helicopter at a cost of $185 uh, uh, dollars, uh, to the Army, $308 to the Air Force. But the actual cost would be higher because all trips are round trips, and in the uh, case of the Army, uh, the cost to get a helicopter to the Pentagon or Andrews has to be included, and it makes it about $460 per flight. Now, according to an Army travel map, uh, uh, memorandum, I'm using the Army's own figures, it's only 15 miles between the Pentagon and Andrews Air Force Base, and on traffic can get there from 15 minutes to uh, at the maximum in rush hour. 50 minutes would be what it would take. Remember, it's 24 hours to fly there by helicopter, a cost of $460. Um, the cost to drive from the Pentagon to Andrews in a privately owned vehicle round trip at the government reimbursement rate of 30 cents a mile is $9. According to a local taxi company, taxi fare between the Pentagon and Andrews is about $30. Thus, for gross comparison purposes, an Army UH-1 helicopter flight would cost in excess of $400 more than a car, and uh, an Army UH-60 helicopter trip could cost almost $1,600 more than a car, and yet there were literally hundreds of these flights uh, taken uh, last year. And you have to ask yourself, who's so important that to shave five or ten minutes off the trip, it is worth uh, traveling uh, by helicopter? Uh, you've got to admit, I guess it's faster than uh, uh, using HOV lanes or something, something. but it's, uh, uh, this is a, just a gross abuse uh, that is very, very close uh, to home. Uh, I was also dismayed to read in the uh, media today about the fact that many of our congressional representatives are taking trips abroad during this uh, holiday season as well visiting embassies, asking personnel to come up who have not been funded uh, by the Congress yet as well. And there is some congressional abuse of this, and we'll be looking in those uh, issues as well. I think what applies to the executive branch should apply to Congress as well in terms of how we use uh, these uh, aircrafts. Um, but I think the purpose of this hearing is important. I think there are tremendous savings that can be had for the American taxpayer if we utilize this and bring some cost consciousness uh, into play. I once again applaud Chairman Horn for uh, calling this uh, hearing today and thank the witnesses. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Now yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Scarborough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for this important hearing. And I've, I've got to echo the remarks of uh, Mr. Davis uh, that this does cut both ways. But I've got to tell you, one of the things that absolutely shocked me by looking through some of these documents are the fact is that the GAO's studies have, ha have shown 
that the President of the United States and his administration is running a VIP airlines uh, for their staff members that are costing taxpayers uh, millions and millions of dollars. Uh, this budget debate has clearly focused on some very important issues, issues such as spending and government accountability and deficit spending and where do we draw the line in spending. And yet, it's amazing to me uh, that Bill Clinton uh, and the administration continue to say that, that the federal government continue to spend more and more and waste more and more, and this documentation clearly shows why. Um, the administration, it, through these studies, have exemplified the culture of waste, fraud, and abuse uh, that has had a cumulative impact. If you, if you take uh, all the spending across uh, all the agencies, it shows how we did get to be $5 trillion in debt and, and, and shows that, again, shows that there's just a, a general lack of consciousness among senior executives at the White House. And uh, I think all of us have, have looked at dismay at some of the things that have been happening over at the Energy Department uh, with Hazel O'Leary's uh, travels. I've got a couple quotes out of uh, some, some newspaper publications that I'm sure uh, uh, the GAO will be looking at in the future. Uh, but the Los Angeles Times reported on December 10th, 1995, quote, on a recent trip to Pakistan, the Energy Secretary rented an MGM airplane normally used by rock stars and royal families. Complete with staterooms and a stand-up bar, the total cost for this plane trip was $415,000, as the chairman noted, much more expensive than flying commercial. In that same article, the Times reported, on a week-long trip to South Africa in August, O'Leary took along 51 department employees, plus an entourage of 68 business executives, academics, and others. They flew on a luxury jet occasionally used by Madonna. Photographers and video crews were hired to follow along and shoot the highlights. The cost to taxpayers, according to the Los Angeles Times, $560,000. The Washington Post reported on December 12, 1995, that a cable was produced from the United States ambassador to the UN delegation, uh, John B. Rich, who explained that the size of the U.S. delegation traveling over to the IAEA General Conference exceeded thermonuclear critical mass and threatened to vaporize our message of fiscal austerity. So what does the administration do when they are clearly shown, not only through press reports, by, but by official nonpartisan government documents that there is a serious abuse in travel expenses? What do they do to Hazel O'Leary? This is a no-brainer. What are their quotes? Vice President Al Gore said, quote, on, on December 12th, as reported by the AP after O'Leary's travels uh, became public, Al Gore said, quote, there is nobody in the cabinet who has done a better job of cutting cost and eliminating government waste. The White House Press Secretary Mike McCurry uh, stated on December 13, 1995, quote, the president believes she is doing a superb job as Energy Secretary. Now let me tell you something, Hazel O'Leary's travels and her magical mystery tour across the globe is just a small portion of the waste that's going on. And yet we have an administration who is unwilling to step up to the task of cutting government waste. And considering that we're $5 trillion in debt, considering that he has been, been stonewalling and doesn't want to balance a budget, I find that to be unconscionable. And I thank the chairman for setting these important hearings on a time when many other members are out of town. And I certainly thank uh, those that have come to testify uh, during this holiday season on an important matter that I think in the end uh, we're going to, to, get, to get take care of because of the work of the GAO and because of the work of the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to questioning the witnesses. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just explain the procedures. Some of you, especially GAO, is very familiar with how we operate. Uh, we do swear in all witnesses but the member of Congress for all of our hearings. Uh, and I would ask each of you now to uh, stand and uh, just take the oath. You uh, solemnly swear a testimony you will give the before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let the recorder know that all three witnesses have affirmed. Our practice is to include your written testimony when we introduce you, so that your full statement will be in the record, 
and then we would like you to summarize that statement in five minutes, which then leaves a little more time for questioning. And I'm pretty liberal with that. We'll want to make all your comments out, but summarize the key things and don't read written statements uh, is what is very helpful. So uh, let us go down the line uh, first with our distinguished colleague, the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Roscoe Bartlett, uh, who has spent a lot of time on this issue, and uh, we're grateful to him for the leadership effort that he's made in this area. So the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Bartlett, uh, please begin. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing and providing an opportunity for me to testify. Preventing waste and misuse of taxpayers' money is the issue which brings me before the committee today. At any time, but especially now when Congress is struggling to get spending by the federal government under control, wise stewardship of taxpayer dollars is imperative. This hearing was prompted by numerous examples of at best questionable and at worst indefensible travel at taxpayers' expense by government officials. For instance, on May 24, 1994, former top White House aide David Watkins and associates used two White House military helicopters to go play golf at a course in Newmarket, Maryland, in the district that I represent, the 6th District of Maryland. A June 1995 report by the Government Accounting Office, Government Aircraft, Observations on Travel by Senior Officials, found excessive reliance on government fixed-wing aircraft and helicopters by senior-level officials, primarily in the Defense Department, when lower-cost alternatives were available. In August, Ruth Larson, a reporter with The Washington Times, first broke the story about the questionable traveling of Secretary of Energy Hazel O'Leary. Subsequent news media reports documented that Secretary O'Leary has spent 130 days overseas on 16 trips so far. Her travels are greatly in excess of any other domestic cabinet secretaries. In addition, the Secretary uh, O'Leary's trips often involved unusually large entourages and included travel on private luxury charter jets. I bring up these examples not to dredge up or to dwell on embarrassing incidents. I believe these examples are symptoms of a system that tempts government officials to do foolish things with taxpayers' money. The system is clearly broken and must be fixed. The purpose of this hearing, I believe properly, is identifying the problem or problems with the existing system and then fixing them. Definitely in the case of Mr. Watkins, but I suspect also in the other examples that I cited, the culprit is inadequate or non-existing procedures for public disclosure. My request, the GAO investigated whether there were any other incidents of improper staff use of White House helicopters. The GAO report, White House Staff Use of Helicopters, released in July 95, found no other instances of inappropriate use of the White House helicopters. However, at the time of the Watkins incident, there was only a verbal authorization process for use of the helicopters. This is no longer the case. However, there was and is still no required public disclosure of staff use of White House helicopters. Currently, executive branch agencies in the White House file written reports with the General Services Administration and the Office of Management and Budget. This is like asking the fox to guard the hen house. My number one recommendation to the subcommittee is to develop procedures for regular public disclosure of travel at taxpayers' expense by government officials, whether on government-owned fixed-wing aircraft or helicopters or by commercial aircraft. I am certain that public disclosure procedures can be developed that will maintain and protect national security. Toward that end, I look forward to hearing the testimony and recommendations by representatives of the Government Accounting Office, Department uh, Defense Department, General Services Administrations, and Citizens Against Government Waste. Thank you again for uh, having this committee and permitting me to testify. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I take it you can stay with us uh, for a while? Very good. And you're certainly welcome to join us up here after the panel is concluded. Uh, our next witness is uh, David B. Buckley, the Special Assistant to the Very Able Inspector General of the Department of Defense. Mr. Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the Inspector General regrets that she is unable to be here today and asks that I represent her. I will summarize my statement for the record. I appreciate the opportunity to testify during the investigation of the use of government aircraft by senior government officials and to specifically address our investigation of the use of dedicated aircraft to support the move of an Air Force General, Joseph W. Ashey. 
We are pleased that the Department of Defense has taken critical steps to tighten its policies regarding the use of its aircraft in the wake of our investigation and the work of the General Accounting Office. Our investigation disclosed that on September 9, 1994, General Ashey, his junior enlisted aide, and the General's cat traveled on board a dedicated United States Air Force cargo plane, a C-141, from Italy to Colorado. A C-141 is capable of carrying 200 passengers or 68,000 pounds of cargo. The plane had been dispatched empty from McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey, to Italy. In order for it to fly nonstop with General Ashey, the Air Force twice refueled the plane in midair. The cost of the trip was estimated to be $116,000 and was billed to the Air Mobility Command as a training flight. If another federal agency would have required the same flight arrangements by the Air Force, it would have been billed for $250,000, $600,000. In comparison, a single one-way commercial flight from Rome to Colorado would have cost approximately $650 at the time. General Ashey was moving from Naples, Italy, where he was the Commander Air South, a NATO command, to Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado to become the commander of the United States Space Command. Like all members of the military, he was authorized transportation when traveling from one assignment to another. However, we found no justification for the use of this dedicated aircraft to affect the move because commercial flights were available or the Air Force could have diverted another plane already in Europe and scheduled to return to the States that day to pick up the General. While well, we found no evidence that General Ashey himself knew that he was going to travel on a dedicated aircraft, we were most troubled by the system that unblinkingly dispatched this very expensive mode of transportation for his exclusive use. We found no one in authority who questioned the cost of generating a special air mission to move two people halfway around the world. Despite the various regulatory directives on cost consciousness, the Air Force had developed a culture consistent with the theme that rank has its privileges, that its generals deserve better, and wrote the cost off as air crew training. Personnel at the Air Mobility Command told us they believed they were following accepted military practice, and we confirmed this case was not unique. It is difficult to assign responsibility for wasted resources solely to the Air Mobility Command personnel when their actions, though clearly insensitive to the issue of costs, were apparently driven by a perceived duty to satisfy what they understood to be General Ashey's request and to follow past practice. After just two days in Colorado, General Ashey returned to Washington. This trip caused problems as well. We found that on September 12, General Ashey and his wife boarded a United States Air Force six-passenger jet and flew to Washington, D.C. for his promotion ceremony and returned to Colorado the next day at an estimated cost of $5,020. A single round trip commercial ticket would have just cost $512. We found that General Ashey was accountable for this travel. While the travel by General Ashey and his wife was authorized by regulations, it was wasteful because General Ashey could have arranged for his promotion ceremony at less cost. For example, General Ashey sh should and could have stopped in Washington and route from Naples to Colorado. We found that General Ashey elected to have the government fund these trips rather than bear the personal expense of a commercial ticket for his wife to fly to Washington from Texas, where she had been staying for several weeks before General Ashey left Naples. Consequently, we recommended that the Secretary of the Air Force obtain reimbursement from General Ashey in the amount of $5,020, which has been done. We view the outcome of our investigation as beneficial. Since we began our investigation, there have been several changes to DOD policy on the use of government aircraft that are intended to prevent such wasteful use. The Air Force took several actions to ensure the cost-effective use of training flying hours and to reduce the cost of reassignment travel. The Commander Air Mobility Command promulgated a new policy regarding the use of training flying hours by AMC aircraft. Numbered Air Force commanders, usually lieutenant generals, must now approve the use of training flying hours to accomplish other than direct training requirements. Officials believe that the increased scrutiny by senior commanders will ensure that training flying hours are used and accounted for appropriately. In February 1995, the Chief of Staff Air Force disseminated new guidance restricting the use of Air Force aircraft for reassignment travel, <coughs> excuse me, of senior officials. In the future, dedicated Air Force aircraft may only be used in exceptional circumstances. Additionally, the Vice Chief of Staff Air Force must approve the use of Air Force aircraft dedicated for reassignment travel 
of senior officials. The DOD has revised its policy on the use of government aircraft and air travel by senior officials. A revised policy memorandum signed by the Deputy Secretary of Defense on October 1, 1995 contains corrective action in response to the findings in our report and GAO's report. It dictates, one, that every effort must be made to minimize military air costs. The policy memorandum states that the organization should select aircraft based on minimum cost and size necessary to accomplish the mission, should not schedule training missions whose principal purpose would be to accommodate travel by senior DOD officials, and should emphasize advanced planning so that scheduling conflicts do not dictate the use of military aircraft. Two, that rotary wing aircraft may only be used when its cost compares favorably to ground transportation or when ground transportation would have a significant adverse impact on the ability of the senior official to effectively accomplish the purpose of the travel. And three, that required use travelers obtain prior approval from the Secretary of Defense or Service Secretary before using military aircraft for reassignment travel. The term required use travel refers to a category of senior DOD officials that includes all four-star general or flag officers. Required use travelers are required to use military aircraft for all official travel because of their need for continuous secure communication, personal security, or exceptional scheduling requirements dictated by frequent short notice travel. There is continued emphasis on adhering to the Department of Defense guidance regarding senior official travel. On December 19th, the Office of the Secretary of Defense Executive Secretariat disseminated a new policy memorandum within OSD, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and two defense agencies, stressing the need for advanced planning of military, I'm sorry, advanced planning of commercial travel to avoid short notice requirements for military air. In conclusion, we believe that our investigation of General Ashey's travel has resulted in heightened sensitivity to cost when providing services to senior officials and in changes to policy that will reduce, but probably not eliminate, the wasteful use of DOD aircraft. This concludes my prepared statement. We appreciate that. Uh, we will go down and have all the witnesses make their opening statement and then throw it all open to questions. Uh, Mr. Gebeke, uh, who is the Director of Military Operations, Capability Issues for the National Security and International Affairs Division of the General Accounting Office. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. Thank you very much for inviting us here to testify. Uh, I'd like to discuss two reports that we've recently issued, the one on the staff use uh, in the White House of helicopters, and second, some observations we have on senior government officials traveling on government aircraft. Let me turn first to the White House staff use of uh, helicopters. Uh, this study was, was prompted by uh, Congressman Bartlett and five of his colleagues, and it really stemmed from the May 24, 1994 trip uh, of several staffers from the White House, which uh, took a helicopter. The gentleman took a helicopter, went to uh, Camp David, where they stopped briefly, and then went on to uh, a golf course uh, where they played golf and then were ferried by helicopter back to the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, Mr. Bartlett, Bartlett and his colleagues asked two questions. They said, uh, the White House had reported at the time 12 trips, and they added two more subsequent to that for a total of 14. And Mr. Bartlett said, uh, were there any other trips? Is this the tip of the iceberg? And were the procedures followed on May 24th? And uh, we spent quite a bit of time researching records at the White House and also at the Marine Corps, because the Marine Corps squadron in Quantico provides the helicopters to the President, the Vice President, the First Lady, and the White House staff. Uh, we did conclude that the 14 trips uh, provided by the White House, in, in fact, were the only trips where White House staff had used helicopters. Um, we also, we went through a number of steps, and I won't elaborate here, I can do it later, to verify that information, and we are confident that there were no additional trips during the period in question. The second question concerned the procedures in place. Uh, for the May 24th trip and whether or not the procedures were followed. Uh, what we found, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that there were no uh, written procedures uh, for the staff's use of helicopters. Uh, in fact, uh, the request is made orally and the acceptance or the denial of the flight is also made orally. So, in effect, 
the procedures were followed because everything was done orally. Uh, since we did our work, and I guess right subsequent to the May 24th trip on May 31st of 1994, there was a change in policy in the White House, and it actually elevated the approval authority to the White House Chief of Staff for staff use of helicopters. It was in the White House um, military office, so it had been elevated quite a bit. Let me turn now to the second report on operational support airlift aircraft, which are operated by the Department of Defense. And as you pointed out in your opening statement, we're talking here about 500-plus aircraft that are used principally to move uh, people, but also can move uh, supplies on occasion. And the interesting thing to note here, Mr. Chairman, is that these aircraft are based on a wartime need. So the number of aircraft that the DOD has in its fleet should be dedicated on how many they need to fight uh, two major regional contingencies. Uh, there are two issues here that I'll, I'll point out very briefly. One is, how many aircraft does the DOD need in wartime? And the second question is, who and how do you go about using those aircraft that you have in peacetime? And those are the two issues. Now, on the first issue, how many do we need? There are a number of studies done, about five or, or maybe more, that all stated between 1993 and 95, and these are not just GAO studies, these are DOD studies as well, that the DOD had more aircraft in its inventory uh, than it needed. Uh, there was al also quite a few discrepancies in each of those reports about how many aircraft the DOD actually has in its inventory. There are some definitional problems. Uh, in attempting to define what an OSA aircraft actually is. At the time we did our study, we came up with a number of, of 520. Uh, as you pointed out in your opening remarks, the uh, Joint Chief of Staff has recently studied this issue, and he's come to the conclusion that DOD only needs 391 aircraft. Uh, so that represents a reduction of 100-plus uh, aircraft in the current fleet, depending upon how you count them. Um, what the DOD next needs to, to figure out, and I think they've taken some steps uh, in this regard, is when they get that fleet sized appropriately, they need to determine how much of those aircraft are excess and get rid of those aircraft, because I think all three of you gentlemen made an interesting comment, and that is the more aircraft we have, the more we're going to use, and if we don't need them, we need to cut down on how many we actually have in the fleet. But the second part is how, many air, how should they use the aircraft in peacetime? They know how they're going to use them in wartime, but we're not often at war, fortunately. So the issue is, how do we use them in peacetime? And uh, Mr. Buckley had pointed out a memorandum of October the 1st, which we think will go a long way towards solving some of the problems that uh, the DOD has had in the future on the use of this aircraft. He elaborated quite well on some of those procedures that uh, are in place now. and. Um, they deal with such things as using the smallest plane available, don't establishing a training mission uh, just to create an opportunity for someone to use the aircraft. And important to us, because our study included uh, quite a bit of analysis on helicopter use, is this new position that the DOD is taking with regard to comparing the cost of ground transportation to helicopter travel before you make that decision. So uh, what remains to be seen is how effectively this new policy will be implemented. But the actions are certainly steps in the right direction. Mr. Chairman, that completes a, a summary of, of our work, and I'd be glad to respond to questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Our last witness on this panel is Mr. David Williams, the Research Director for Citizens Against Government Waste. Welcome, Mr. Williams. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today before this subcommittee. My name is David Williams, and I represent the 600,000 members of the Citizens Against Government Waste. Mr. Chairman, we welcome this hearing and your willingness to take a candid look at the excessive and extravagant use of aircraft and staff by the current Secretary of Energy. The Secretary of Energy retains a staff of 14 just to handle her invitations and travel. The Secretary claims the excessive spending is justified from the results of her 16 foreign trips. Mr. Chairman, in 1871, Mrs. O'Leary's cow started the Chicago fire. Well, today, Secretary O'Leary's travels have started their own firestorm. Nearly all federal government departments and agencies are involved in varying degrees in personnel travel and transportation. 
The Grace Commission reported that each agency administers its own travel budget and procures its own travel and related services. The Grace Commission found that although certain general guidelines have been established pertaining to government travel, they often deal with limitations and restrictions and have little bearing upon the efficient and economic procurement of travel services. <coughs> this hearing and criticism of Secretary O'Leary's travels constitute a legitimate inquiry into excessive travel and should not be characterized as a witch hunt. In August of 1995, Secretary O'Leary allowed 51 Energy Department employees plus an entourage of 68 business executives, academics, and others to accompany her to South Africa. The group flew on a luxury jet occasionally used by Madonna, as mentioned by Mr. Scarborough. Her entourages are larger than those of Elvis Presley, Shaquille O'Neal, and the Rolling Stones combined. John B. Rich, chief of the U.S. mission to the United Nations in Vienna, commented that Secretary O'Leary's entourage exceeded thermonuclear critical mass and threatened to vaporize our message of fiscal austerity to the UN. The Secretary's magical mystery tour has traveled to places such as Austria, the Czech Republic, South Africa, Costa Rica, Italy, India, China, Hong Kong, Azerbaijan, and Moscow and Paris twice, Paris being the city of lights. Secretary O'Leary justified her overseas trips by saying, she views the missions as a way to earn their way to continue to exist as a Department of Energy. The price tag for chartering the plane was $415,000, with a total cost of $560,000 for the mission. We believe that's a high price for the taxpayer to pay in order to justify future energy and research spending. If Secretary O'Leary is truly concerned about the future of the Energy Department, she should focus less on far-flung frivolities and implement the numerous cost-saving recommendations offered by Citizens Against Government Waste, the National Performance Review, the Congressional Budget Office, members of Congress, and many others. The Energy Department also spent $43,000 on a study conducted by her agency to rate how favorable journalists and sources are to her department. Secretary O'Leary unapologetically blamed her public affairs staff. However, we do commend Secretary O'Leary for making some tough decisions concerning federal employees. Under her tenure, the Energy Department has reduced contractors staffed by nearly 15,000. Secretary O'Leary can take credit for saving $18 million on support contractor costs also. Mr. Chairman, these trade missions do have supporters in Congress. Many believe Secretary O'Leary's overseas trade missions have paid off richly. Citizens Against Government Waste believes in promoting our country's resources abroad, but it must be done more efficiently. We recognize that many energy programs are technical and scientific in nature and necessitates the hiring of special professionals to be paid accordingly. But it doesn't take a nuclear physicist to figure out that chartering a plane which, uh, with a stand-up bar for $415,000 is a little excessive, especially for a plane described by the Secretary as nothing but a cold, dog-ass 35-year-old plane that leaked. Secretary O'Leary has become an unrepentant symbol of a government gone wild. She just doesn't get it. Taxpayers no longer believe that the current administration really does fuel their pain. The President and his administration have a moral responsibility to demonstrate leadership and be models of fiscal integrity. In November, Secretary O'Leary told a House hearing that on her excursions to India and other countries, U.S. businesses have signed the contracts for over $10 billion worth of energy services or manufacturing in the times that I have been there. The Energy Department has cited other figures totaling $19.7 billion in business dealings. However, this month, the Department revised those figures significantly and is now claiming the total for four trade missions was closer to $1.4 billion, not the $19.7. Even for government finances, that's a large margin of error. Recent reports estimate that her trips to India, Pakistan, China, and South Africa cost hardworking taxpayers a total of $2.6 million. While Frank Sinatra saying, fly me to the moon, the chairman of the board does not mean with Secretary O'Leary and her entourage. As a national taxpayer watchdog group, we will continue to keep a vigilant eye not only the Department of Energy, but on all agency travel. I have a list of recommendations that I would like to go into later if, uh, if you care to hear them. Very good. We'll be very glad to hear them. Let me uh, begin the questioning before I yield to my colleagues with a few questions for Mr. Gebeke. Uh, primarily, and also uh, Mr. Uh, Buckley. Uh, if the staff will put up there the uh, top 20 Department of Defense destination pairs between January 93, uh, 
the audience really can't see it, but it's in the report the uh, members have. Uh, what I want to ask both the Inspector General's representative and the Controller General's representative is the following. Uh, Mr. White, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, has recently, as was suggested, issued a directive to try and improve the practices in the Department of Defense. In the judgment of your professional staffs, does that do the job or does something else need to be done? Um, I would think that's a step in the right direction. But frequently, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, uh, policies and, and procedures are steps in the right direction, but how those policies and procedures are implemented is probably paramount. Uh, I think it remains to be seen whether or not additional steps will be necessary, but certainly I would commend the DOD for taking the steps that they have taken. Because the point was made here, for example, in the White House, and it's typical, lower level, military office, White House staff aide, friend of the president, top official, phones up, says, I want transportation. Obviously, they're going to try to be supportive. Do we have the same situation in the Pentagon? A general phones up. Well, of course, General, we'll have that plane there. So the question is the level of review for some of the excess travel. I have no problem, no member of Congress does, with somebody on mission business trying to get the job done. Thirty years ago, as a young Senate assistant, I saw the fact that Senator Margaret Chase Smith of Maine had been abroad and looked at this particular water resource project turned the whole discussion around in an executive session of appropriations. Nobody else knew what was going on. She did. She'd go on, she'd ask the questions. So nobody objects to that type of situation. What our problem here is, is the excessive flamboyance with which some of these facilities are used. And you start with a very simple thing, that helicopter trip from the Pentagon to Andrews is just ludicrous. Uh, when you think that the rest of us, the members of Congress, of course, drive their own cars, whereas practically every captain has a chauffeur in uh, some of these places, uh, especially on some of the bases. But uh, that's what I'm trying to get at. Where's the proper level of review without having some very high official have a clogged desk with all this nonsense? How do we deal with that? And does the Inspector General satisfied with the procedures that come with the Deputy Secretary's memoranda? Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think we are satisfied with the procedures. It, the test is going to be whether or not those procedures are properly implemented. I think that right now, because of the spotlight that's been placed on this issue, the procedures are being implemented properly. The, the memo just a few weeks ago, just a couple weeks ago from the Executive Secretariat, points out that um, this review must take place and don't try and get underneath the wire or your nose under the tent by scheduling things or pr pretending to schedule things at the last minute. It is a shame that it requires that level of review and this level of attention, but it's a culture that has to be fixed. Um, right. And it's going to take a level of attention for some time before everyone gets the message and the general looks, his staff uh, shows him that it's going to cost the government $116,000 to do this. If you fly on Delta, it's going to cost 300. And if, if that doesn't click, then we've got more than just a culture problem, yeah. I think. I'll tell you how you get the message very fast. If you work that into the promotion evaluation from colonel to brigadier general, brigadier general to major general, and you look at the trip sheets on where this person went, you break that culture very rapidly. If they, that's the one way you show you're taking it seriously. Now, on that uh, pair list up there, I'm curious with GAO and the inspector general is familiar with it also, <coughs> Uh, did that reveal any particular set of pairs that seem to be a place you don't always have to go to, but it was good to go? Or is this just interesting data? Does it have any other implications besides uh, a chart with city pairs and the number of trips? And the reason I ask that is people have known for years that somehow when the Army-Navy game is played, a lot of people of high rank are able to show up there in various and sundry <coughs> modes of transportation. Now, uh, the Army-Navy game has not been played at the Wright-Patterson uh, Air Force Base, so uh, I'm just curious, did this chart reveal anything? Uh, Mr. Chairman, when we uh, compiled this chart, nothing uh, jumped out at us that, uh, along the lines of, of what you uh, uh, suggested. Uh, these are uh, locations where you would expect 
uh, military officers to probably travel to. Um, we did not look, as you're probably aware, at the specific purpose for each one of the trips behind these numbers, so I couldn't, couldn't comment on that. You know, we probably should note, too, that there are certain, uh, and I'm sure you would agree, there are certain required users. There are certain people who should fly military aircraft regardless of the cost involved, and uh, the Pentagon allows for that, and I think we need to make that point as well. Well, l let me get to the point, as it was suggested. It's sort of the meat axe approach, and I think it's sometimes very stupid, as I'm sure you would agree. On the other hand, it does get results, and it might be justified, and I think it probably is in this. Uh, you noted uh, that uh, there are 520 uh, uh, aircraft assigned to this type of mission, transporting the high-level officials. The Joint Chiefs have said we need about 391, I take it. Uh, based on their study. Uh, now, the Gulf War data, which I referred to in my opening statement, uh, we had uh, a one-front war, if you would, and uh, we're planning in case you ever had a two-front war. And we can relate these types of aircraft to that basic strategic uh, end. Forty-eight airplanes presumably used in the Gulf War for this type of ferrying back and forth. Uh, if you double that, uh, saying you're waging some conflicts on two fronts and you're ferrying people back and forth, you get to 96. So the question is obvious. Uh, is the 391 that the Joint Chiefs are willing to settle on, which is down from 520, still excessive? If 96 planes, could, based on the Gulf War experience, could handle it, what am I missing? Uh, the only piece that uh, we'd have to factor in to that, uh, that thought would be the fact that the 391 would also include aircraft that are used uh, in the continental United States in support of the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we tried to get numbers on those, Mr. Chairman, uh, the services did not have those numbers readily available in support of the Persian Gulf War. So certainly there would be a, a, a number of flights and fairing that would have to take place within the continental uh, United States. You know, the really uh, the important thing on that score, uh, on the 391 number, is that for the first time the services have, if you will, put their aircraft together to figure out how best to use all of the assets that they have. And that's the first time that the DOD has really done that. It has always been a service-specific number of aircraft needed. And you know yourself, when you, when you go to a theater, you've got aircraft from all services there. So you've got a lot of overlap. And, um, that, that's what the, the real significance of the 391. But you raise an interesting point. Is 391 too many? And I think, you know, we'll have to see. That remains to be seen. Uh, would the GAO take a look at that in terms of dispersal? And, I mean, let's face it, they have worldwide responsibilities, and we have to be sensitive to that. And that would mean you don't necessarily get the economies you would have in the continental United States, uh, going to some uh, very backwater areas. Uh, what I'm curious is, when this executive travel is made in the civilian part of the government, of the executive branch, to whose budget are those trips charged? For example, if a White House aide says to the military office, now the chief of staff has to approve it, uh, I need a helicopter, is that charged off to the Department of Defense or the White House budget? I, I don't know the answer. To Would you both okay. look and file it for the record at this point? My suspicion is it's charged off to the Department of Defense. Uh, I mean, every president since Franklin Roosevelt has brought people all over the place in to help, and uh, with it goes assigning it to their budget. Now, what I think is one way to get at this is if you charge the transportation to the budget of the person requesting it, you'd get very rapid response. One, it would show up in the Congressional Annual Appropriations hearings a lot easier when they can review that type of behavior, and you'd have a cost that hits the pocketbook of the person using the flight. And uh, that's one way to take a look at it. Yes, sir. I, under the Economy yeah. Act, of course, yeah. under the Economy Act, of course, when another federal agency uses a DOD resource, then that agency reimburses the Department of Defense. But your specific question was on the White House, and I do not know the answer. We'll be happy to look at that. The gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Bartlett, has a comment on this. He's studied it thoroughly. Mr. Chairman, I think that your surmise is correct that it's charged to, to DOD. That's the impression we got when we asked these questions when we were involved in, 
in looking at that uh, helicopter incident in the 6th District. And I think you're right that if these charges showed up on the uh, balance sheet of the department that requested the flights, that there would be a whole lot more accountability. You know, in uh, years past, when we had little idea of microbes and, and their effects and so forth, we learned that if you expose things to the light of day, if you put things outside, that somehow things were more healthy. And I think that that's true today. Uh, and I think that, that public disclosure is one of the best uh, guarantees that these procedures, and I think procedures now in place are, are pretty good. And the concern is, will these procedures be followed? And I think that the best way to make sure they're followed is to have adequate public disclosure. I would suggest that, that quarterly is probably quite adequate, but you shouldn't have to make a request. By the way, I understand that, um, that travel reports filed with GSA and <coughs> OMB are not even released to Congress, except we make a special request. And I think that if these um, uh, reports are just made a part of the public record, that there will be a whole lot more incentive to be, uh, uh, to be accountable. If you know that, uh, that these are made public every quarter and that the whole world will see what you have done during that quarter, I think that, that every time that someone requests the use of a, of a dedicated aircraft rather than going by automobile or getting a commercial aircraft, that, that that will be flagged in their mind. And I think that public disclosure, very simple. It will, if done properly, cost very, very little. And I think that the savings would be absolutely enormous. I think the gentleman's absolutely correct. One last question. I don't know if you have the data for it. If not, file it for the record. On the helicopter flight that you investigated, was there a second helicopter in that situation? Or was there just one? Now, we understand that there was a support helicopter a as well that followed uh, the initial helicopter. Did you get the list of the passengers on board each helicopter? Uh, we know the passengers on the principal helicopter. I don't think there were any passengers on the second helicopter. Well, do we know that for a certainty? I can find out. Because there have been various record. rumors there were, and I don't know, and I'd just like to file it for the record. If you get the passenger list for both helicopters, we'll put it at this point in the record. Okay. Thank you. Now I yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Uh, Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree. I'd like to see the passenger list on that second helicopter. It would be uh, very interesting. I don't know why they went all the way to Western Maryland, Mr. Bartlett, when right at Quantico, where the uh, copters fly out of, there's a Robert Trent Jones golf course right there. It happens to be in, uh, in Northern Virginia, and I would recommend if they want to do that again up our economy instead of uh, Western Maryland. Just kidding. It, I, it, think, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Bartlett hit it in the head when he said disclosure will do a lot in this to uh, bring practices more into line in terms of what's fiscally uh, real. Uh, look at the headlines of the Washington Post today. Furloughs fail uh, to ground overseas trips by Congress. Uh, but once the disclosure comes out and they start asking questions, uh, you see some of these trips start disappearing. And that will happen with executive agencies as well uh, as these disclosures come out and people who are taking these trips have to become accountable for them, whether it's in the military or whether it's in the high-level executive positions. Uh, I think that will bring practices uh, uh, closer to uh, what makes a, a business sense than anything else uh, we can do. So I think we can explore that. I have a couple questions for the panel. Um, when we start allocating the cost of a trip, I just want to understand what, what has happened. We talk about the cost to fly a helicopter from Andrews Air Force Base to the Pentagon being uh, uh, hundreds of dollars. The cost of a trip, though, you factor overhead and pilot's time and take a pro rata uh, part of that, don't you, in factoring that in? In reality, isn't the net cost to the taxpayer the difference of you're, you're paying the pilots anyway, you're paying for the helicopter anyway, even if it just sits on the ground. The gas you, is extra and you pay for. You know, what do we talk about when we talk about the cost of these trips? Because when you have so many planes, even if you, you, don't, if you have one flight, it's going to cost a lot more than if you have 30 flights because you're dividing up the overhead. Is, am I correct on that? And can somebody shed some light on how this is uh, uh, really figured? Yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right on that. With, with one exception, I don't believe in the cost information we provided, Mr. Davis, that we have included, nor does the Pentagon include, as a part of the cost, the salaries of the, of the pilot and the co-pilot, if, if there is one. Um, but the issue becomes one, and I think you alluded to it earlier, is whether or not we have the right number I mean, if we have more than we need, we'll probably find ways to use them. Do we need as many as we have, I think, is, is really the issue. And our information uh, since April of 
of uh, last year through March of this year indicated, for instance, the number of helicopter flights has declined drastically. Now, the Army, uh, Secretary of the Army took a position in December of last year, just about a year ago, that he was going to permit very few people to fly between those two helicopter locations that, that you cited. And um, the, the memo that uh, was implemented on, on October 1st basically uh, spread that same policy to the other services. Uh, so there are many, many fewer flights uh, taking place now between the Pentagon and, and Andrews Air Force Base, which leads me to believe that a lot of people were flying who didn't need to fly because if they still need to go over there, they're finding other ways to get there now. Of course. Well, clearly yeah. from Andrews to the Pentagon, where it's just a 20-minute drive right. around the Beltway, uh, you, you have to ask yourself who is so important and what security is available. Uh, that they have to fly back and forth, and it's not in the hundreds. Uh, I, I, don't, I think that's very, very clear from this. And once again, I think the result of fewer helicopter uh, flights is the fact that there was public disclosure on this. And once they find out, uh, the users uh, of, of these uh, aircraft find out that it's going to be public and they're going to have to account for it, uh, you, you can see that the, uh, everything changes. I was looking at the uh, report on the general's uh, flight uh, from uh, Europe uh, to Colorado, and I saw nobody was accountable. The general said he didn't know it was going to cost this. Nobody is accountable. Once somebody has to be accountable for this, you see the flights decrease rapidly because in many cases it's just very, very hard to justify. Uh, the other issue is when you have these aircraft sitting around on the ground and you've got pilots sitting around drinking coffee waiting for a flight, sure, they're going to be utilized and you almost have to justify uh, their use by uh, inventing uh, uh, trips in some cases. Certainly is an appropriate use, but it's been far overused and uh, that's what I think we're trying to get at today. Just another comment, I'd be happy to get a reaction from anybody on the panel. Uh, Mrs. O'Leary talked about the, that she saved the uh, money by signing all these contracts uh, when she was in India with her entourage. Uh, but isn't the point that she could have signed those contracts if she flew over coach? Or she could have signed those contracts if she flew first class with her group? Did you have to hire a private airplane? I just asked for a reaction from the panel on that. That's one of the points that we uh, have in the written testimony is that she didn't have to fly first class. And what happened is she upgraded from coach to first class. So here we have, once again, an accountability issue. Every year, our organization publishes our pig book. And when we bring to light some of the pork barrel projects associated with some of the members in Congress, well, guess what? Once they're exposed, they're not very proud of this, the way that money gets appropriated for it. So you have to use the same mentality when you're talking about travel. If these people are accountable for their travel expenses and the amount that they're spending, then it's going to change. Then and only then will it change. Now there's no accountability. And the Grace Commission back in 1982 said there is no accountability. And one of the, the beauties of the Chief Financial, Financial Officers Act is it provides that accountability. And unfortunately, the CFO hasn't been in long enough where we've been able to see results from having such a strong uh, officer keeping track of uh, the finances. And hopefully that will correct some of the problems. But accountability is the issue, whether it be travel, whether it be anything in this government that is wasting money is accountability. Let me, uh, a final question. I, in my previous life, before I arrived in Congress, I was a, uh, a general counsel for a government contractor. One of the uh, most difficult cases I ever had was defending uh, airplane uh, uh, flights uh, to, for reimbursement uh, from the federal government to, to DCA, Defense Contract Audit Agency, and other uh, groups. It seems to me, though, that most of these flights that I've looked at the federal level uh, would never have been reimbursed if these were used by private contractors, and yet the federal government is justifying. And it seems to me that we ought to have the same standard. If a federal contractor could, uh, could write them off and get reimbursed uh, for them as part of their overhead or G&A expenses, uh, then the uh, uh, federal government under the same criteria ought to be able to use their plane. But if the federal government uh, is using one criteria to apply to themselves and another for private contractors. That seems not only contradictory, but it's, it, it shows that there is not the same uh, cost consciousness. Any uh, comment on that from any of the panel members? Well, I, I'll just say, sir, that as you're well aware, those cost accounting measures that apply to contractors are largely based on um, the same federal regulations that apply to most federal employees when they travel. In other words, most federal employees most. cannot Exactly. And that's We're talking key. about the culture at the top. The, the employees at the lower levels, uh, even mid-level management, fly coach, um, just as we expect the contractors do. And we don't reimburse the contractors for that. If they decide to fly business, that's fine. 
but they can only build at the coach level. And that's what we're talking about here is the culture at the top. The, right. The rank and file federal employees, I think, understand this very well, get the message, and are not part of the problem. Yes, I think they're part of the solution as we get into accountability. And Mr. Bartlett had a question. Your comments about the uh, Secretary's use of dedicated aircraft and justifying it on the basis that some contracts were signed. When she used it, reminds me that you can certainly kill flies with a $20 sledgehammer, but you can do it also with a 50 cent fly swatter, and it's more appropriate. Thank you very much. Any other comments? All right. I have two comments. One is, we have 556 recommendations on how to cut spending, and there are a lot in the Department of Energy. She can stay at home, and she can read our publication and save a lot more money than she is going overseas to try to collect. So there is no excuse for her to go over and to spend all this taxpayer's money to do that. And it's the whole mentality of the federal government where in September you have the end of your spending spree. Get the money out the door. You are not rewarded for saving money. You are rewarded for spending money. And that is the problem with the travel. And the Department of Energy is not the only department involved in this. Department of Commerce. Uh, Ron Brown's office exceeded their budget by 145 percent. So it's not just one person that's doing this. It's a mentality throughout the federal government that has to be changed. Right. Thank you. My time is up for I yield, Ms. Garber. I just say this. I don't want to personalize this toward Ms. O'Leary. She has a tremendously difficult job in downsizing uh, her agency. I think she's made, frankly, some very tough, courageous uh, decisions, and I wouldn't want to diminish that by trying to single her out. As we say, this is a culture at the top that applies across the board to other agencies. Uh, she just happened to be the recipient of getting caught in this one and having it disclosed. And I think if we had more disclosure, uh, there would be less of this. Thank you. I thank the gentleman of Virginia. Let me ask one question following up on what the gentleman's pursued, and G, uh, maybe a GAO knows the answer too. Uh, to what accounts was Mrs. O'Leary's trip that cost over $400,000 charged? Do we know? I do not know that. We have can, not done that work. Uh, well, we'll ask GSA on the next panel then, or uh, you can you follow up, work it out with staff, put it in the record at this point, and then uh, we'll bring it out. I now am delighted to yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Scarborough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to follow up on something that uh, Congressman Davis uh, just said and, and want to get a response from any panel members who, uh, who may be able to uh, shed some light on it. He, uh, he had said that he didn't want to single out Hazel O'Leary uh, because she uh, she's, uh, was the one that got caught, but actually it's a culture of, of waste, fraud, and abuse throughout the entire government. Uh, let me ask each of you, uh, are there other examples of, of such outrageous waste uh, in the government? Or is Hazel O'Leary, as far as travel goes, or uh, is Hazel O'Leary's uh, uh, example right now the most egregious in the Clinton administration? You mentioned Ron Brown, Mr. Williams. Um, he's, he's been before this committee, uh, the overall committee, testifying that he's cut back and, and made the Commerce Department lean and mean, and there's that quote, there's not one penny of corporate welfare in the Department of Commerce. That's for another hearing. Uh, also borders on perjury. But my question is this, are other agencies as irresponsible as uh, in their travel expenses as Hazel O'Leary has been? Well, my first comment is the Department of Commerce is corporate welfare. I think the whole department is corporate welfare. But to get back to your question, we have sources inside of the Department of Commerce that have paperwork that says that he has exceeded, the Secretary's office has exceeded his travel budget by 145 percent and the whole department by 31 percent. So I don't know where they're cutting the, uh, the cost, but it's not in his office or travel throughout the um, agency. The um, Secretary of Energy and her travel uh, uh, follies really have opened the door and now we're going to look into other agencies and see if we can open the door even wider and look into uh, more abuses because I don't think that is just one or two agencies. I think that getting back to uh, Mr. Davis, he says it's, you know, the mentality, the culture, and it's still, it's persistent in every agency. So it's really going to, it's going to be a tough task because of the way that the accounting systems are. There are, you know, thousands of accounting systems in this federal government. So to be able to crack the door open and find each agency and what they're spending on travel is going to be very tough, but now that we have our foot in the door, let's walk all the way in. Thanks. Um, let, let me ask this question, and just to be fair to both sides of the aisle here, um, how does this administration compare with past administrations? Uh, we obviously had waste uh, 
in Republican administrations as well as in Democratic administrations. And of course, the pur purpose of this hearing is not simply to point fingers. I don't think the Congress of the United States has any right to be self-righteous about traveling uh, to exotic places. Uh, but, the, but the question is this, how does the Clinton administration compare with past administrations, uh, Republican and Democrat alike? Are we seeing an increase, an explosion uh, of abuse, or do you all not have figures on that? That's open to the whole panel. Well, John Sununu was famous for his uh, travel exploits, and we testified back in 1991 before uh, the committee on travel excesses by prior administrations. So, so it's not so, so today you're not here. This isn't a witch hunt no. on the Clinton administration. You you have attacked Republican administrations in the past, and now you're attacking Democratic uh, administrations. So you're a nonpartisan. We're we're nonpartisan, and the Grace Washington. Commission came out in 1984 during President Reagan's tenure. And w Peter Grace criticized the federal government in 1984. So, I mean, this is one of the more popular Republican presidents that Peter Grace, the late Peter Grace, took a shot at and said there are 2,478 ways to save money in the federal government. So this is definitely nonpartisan. Okay. Uh, let me ask a question. I I'm sorry, I don't know which witness uh, brought this up, but somebody stated after uh, the golf outing episode, uh, by the way, there's some good courses in my district in Florida, too. Uh, but anyway, um, you, somebody had stated that the decisions on helicopter use was elevated to the White House Chief of Staff for decision-making. Was that Mac McClarty at the time or Leon Panetta? Was that still McClarty? McClarty yeah. Yes, sir, that was still McClarty. Okay, if I could ask, and I, I'll let you feel free to comment and, and then open it up to the whole panel. Uh, again, just for a purpose of fairness, uh, how have they been doing since uh, since the decision was was put up to um, the chief of staff's position on Hilo use? Have the abuses continued, or have they done a good job at curbing it? And well, I think that the uh, procedures they put in effect are are uh, pretty good. I would like to have a, a public disclosure of these. I think that just the knowledge that they will be available to the public. Is, is good discipline. Uh, you asked the question of whether or not this focus was on only this administration or others. When the helicopter thing was in the news, every time I was uh, uh, making a statement to a reporter in front of a camera, I tried to take the position that I had hoped that focus on this would not be simply <coughs> focus on this one issue, but it would be a focus on what I thought was an endemic problem. You all spoke of it as a cultural problem. And I mentioned the previous administration and some excesses there. And I think this is just something that infects the bureaucracy down here. And I'm really delighted that you're holding this meeting. And now we have these three things, the helicopter incident, the GAO report, and the, and, and the secretary's travels. And I think that if you look at other agencies, you're going to find very similar things. Hers may be a bit more flamboyant than some of the others. But it's hard for me to, to imagine you can exceed your budget by 145 percent and not have some, some extravagant flamboyant use of, 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 of aircraft. And I think you're exactly right that what we have to do here is to change the culture. And I think that you change the culture by having accountability. You know, they tell, tell us that, you know, if you don't want to see it on the front page of your local paper, don't do it and don't say it. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you don't want to see it in the news for these people of your trip, you know, don't take the trip on the dedicated aircraft unless you want to see it on the front page of, of, of some national papers. You know, if you can do it with a, with a uh, contract aircraft or with a, uh, I'm sorry, with a uh, commercial aircraft, you ought to do it. You ought to do it that way. So I really think that, that uh, the procedures that are put uh, that are now there are not all that bad, but what is lacking is the public disclosure. And if nobody's ever going to know that you bend the rules a little, the tendency to bend the rules is going to be there. If that's going to be exposed to the, to, to the white light of, of, of uh, day of the, of the public, then I think there's going to be much less incentive to bend the rules. The rules aren't all that bad now, but I think we just need to, need to have public accountability, public disclosure, so that there will be an incentive not to break them. We'll have another round. Let me just ask a question, then we'll start that round. Uh, Mr. Kebeke, I noticed in the initial presidential directive issued shortly after uh, President Clinton assumed office that uh, the limits were put on presidential appointees who were, in essence, Senate confirmed. Now, there's a lot, and then he included the White House employees also who are not Senate confirmed. 
but there's also a lot of presidential appointees that don't have to have Senate confirmation. And I was just curious if GAOs ever looked at who's excluded that maybe should be included in that. Uh, I happen to serve uh, presidents from Nixon, Ford, Carter to Reagan in a presidential appointment that was Senate confirmed. I remember President Carter was the first, to my knowledge, that issued a very severe order, and I know I followed it, and that was you go the lowest coach fare. Now, that upset a few people I knew who then, you know, paid the difference out of their own pocket, which is fine. But in my case, it was World Airways, and you bring your own lunch. Uh, and I did that faithfully for four years that Carter was in. And uh, it just seems to me that uh, there's some other appointees besides the one Senate confirmed. And we might look at that. And if you could, let's file a statement for the record, talk to o, the Office of Personnel Management, and see who we're leaving out of that little net. Okay. So uh, let me uh, now yield to the gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Davis, do you have some more questions? Yeah, let me start by just reiterating uh, the Chairman Horn's request earlier about the, the, uh, getting the list of the people on that second helicopter. I think that would be revealing, and to date we have not been able to get that from what I understand. And we, once again, disclosure is the key. Uh, in all this to preventing future abuses. So it is in that interest of you put disclosure out and maybe somebody gets red faced. But as we have seen with the helicopter usage today, it has brought, uh, uh, d reduced the number of helicopter trips that uh, appear to be required after it has been disclosed. And I think this, in, th in that spirit, it would be helpful uh, seeing who was there. Let me just ask the G GAO, uh, in your written testimony, um, you state the White House staff may be authorized to use HMX-1 helicopters when they are conducting immediate White House activities. Is there a written policy over what constitutes uh, immediate White House activities? And were the 14 trips uh, to conduct immediate White House activities, do you know what they were for? Uh, you state that 10 had a squadron-specific mission purpose code. What does that mean in layman's terms? Um, the answer to your question is that uh, it is not specifically uh, indicated or specified or defined as to what uh, uh, the use of the helicopters would be for. Um, the 14 uh, that were reported uh, by the White House, we did include in our appendix to that report on page 6. Uh, we did not uh, look at the purpose for those flights specifically. In other words, we did not get behind those 14 flights to find out whether or not they should have been, uh, should have been taken. Our principal purpose, quite frankly, was just to determine whether or not there were additional flights uh, that were not reported. Uh, but a, a cursory review of the 14 none. flights would... You found none, right, because you interviewed all the none, pilots? Right. A cursory review of the 14 flights would, would indicate that they, they look very reasonable to us, but we did not specifically go into depth behind those flights. Thank you. Did you experience any difficulties in obtaining the information uh, from the White House? The White House gave us all the information that, uh, uh, that we wanted. Uh, it took longer uh, to get the information than it typically takes us to receive information from, say, an executive branch agency. Uh, but that is not uh, unusual when GAO deals with the White House, rega regardless of whether it's this White House or previous White Houses. Right. Let me ask, in your written statement, um, you say that the April uh, 1995 OSA inventory of aircraft <coughs> is ten times greater than the aircraft used in the Persian Gulf War, yet the JCS has recommended that the number of OSA aircraft be 391. Uh, do you believe that the services actually need 391 OSA aircraft? And how many should the services have? You, ha you have a, a number at this yeah, point? Yeah, I don't have an idea about that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the chairman was asking me the same question uh, earlier, and we promised that we'd look into that for him. Uh, there is a, a fairly elaborate study that has been done by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and we'll get behind that and look at the methodology for you. And let me ask you, do you is there, can you conclude, or what do you attribute the decline in the use of helicopters by senior level officials in the last few? We've made, we've surmised up here what it is. Do you have a official explanation for well, what might have I, I think uh, two, two reasons, and, and Mr. Buckley might want to comment as well, but uh, one would be the, the Secretary of the Army has really been the leader, in, in my opinion, on this through the policy change he made last December, which really severely limited the number of Army personnel that could use that helicopter. And the, uh, more recently, the, the memorandum of October 1st has also probably led to a, a, an even greater decline. Uh, I think the whole uh, awareness uh, of, 
the ashy flight, uh, the, the White House flight uh, of the helicopter that was questioned uh, in, in May of last year. I mean, all of these items, the work that, that we've done, the work that the Inspector General has done, Mr. Bartlett's interest in this area, I think has heightened the awareness uh, within the White House and within the Pentagon and probably within the civilian agencies as well. Okay, thank you. Mr. Buckley, do you have any comment on that? Sir, I would I'd just echo um, Mr. Gabicki, the, the, the light of day, as the Congressman has said, or a shock to the system is what is usually required to get people to change their ways. And when the Deputy Secretary of Defense personally signs a memorandum down, people salute. And all we can do is make sure that they continue to salute. So really the disclosures of some of the really abuses or uh, the mishandling of this was a shock to the system and it started to make some changes at least for a short period of time. That's why I think continued disclosure continues to be the way to keep the system honest. And uh, maybe some legislation can come out of this hearing that would uh, do exactly that. That's really, th th that is really it seems to me uh, the best way uh, uh, to handle this. So people have to be accountable. I ask a question, for example, on General Ashey's flight. Um, the C-141 that he flew from Naples, uh, we know it was refueled uh, uh, twice in, in uh, midair. Uh, it, it, it carried himself uh, an aide and a cat, I think is my understanding. That's correct. Um, but it had the capability to carry 68,000 pounds of cargo. Do we know how General Ashey's household goods were transported to the United States? Yes, sir. Um, his household goods were uh, transported via military aircraft. But yeah. not that aircraft. It was a different... I that's correct. It was not, they were not on that aircraft. They did a separate flight. But they had to, if, if somebody had really thought this thing through, uh, in, in allocating that $141,000 in cost, obviously the fuel and so on, what else goes into that? Were pilot's salary, was, was the uh, maintenance of the aircraft? You <coughs> know was how that was $116,000, I believe, sir, um, that we're talking about. The, okay. Right, 116,000. Appendix 4 of our report indicates how those costs uh, were developed. And the 116,000 was the, is the lowest rate because that's the way the Air Mobility Command built it as a training flight, training that crew, that air crew, which of course uh, was an extremely experienced air crew. And as far as we know, it, they did not require training. They weren't bumping up against an envelope where they would go non-qualified. Um, but the cost for, the, for a non-government entity to, to, to have the Air Force produce or do the same thing that was done for General Ashe um, is billed at 267000 And that cost would include everything, the cost of the fully air crew loaded, renting those people in addition fully to the Fully loaded, aircraft. as we would say in the yes. contractual air. That's Interesting. correct. Do um, you know what a, and a commercial flight would have cost General Ashe's flights uh, from Naples to Colorado, including his aid and cat? Do we no. know what that would have cost? Yeah, so uh, we... Coach. Uh, coach. Oh, let's give him first class, even first class. Well, he would not have been authorized. We, we looked at coach. Um, <laughs> $650 per person. Uh, one way. Okay. Thank you. I think we've said enough about that. I, the interesting thing in looking at all this is that nobody wanted to admit they made the decision on that. I think there was more scrambling for cover. Is that right? Uh, the, we found the people that made the decision, um, and it was a group of people. But so to, to pin a $116,000 bill on any one person, when this, as far as we saw, is the norm. We this found norm. 12 other four-star officers. This is a systematic problem, failure of the system, really, I think. Yes, the culture. It was, it was, thank you. Uh, I want to follow up on the mention of Deputy Secretary White's uh, implementing order in October 95. Now, the President issued his directive in February of 93. To your knowledge, either the Inspector General's representative or the General Accounting Office representative, did the Pentagon delay the February 93 implementation and not do anything until Deputy Secretary White issued that, or were they carrying out the President's directive of February 1993? In that well, that's a, a double-edged question. The, the President's direction of 19, 1993 and the OMB directives that followed were implemented via memorandum um, by the Department of Defense. Now, the other half of your question was whether or not they were followed. Obviously, in this case, they were not. So, it, um, they, well, no, they had not waited. They did not, the Pentagon did not wait until 1995 to issue instruction. 
Deputy Secretary White's instruction in October of 95 was further clarification and an even harder line um, to be drawn. Because remember, the President's, the, the White House um, instruction did not apply to active duty military officers. They're specifically excluded uh, in that directive. Yeah. So the White Memorandum then, and you mentioned you thought it was fairly significant in getting the message through as Deputy Secretary. Yes, sir. So you expect different behavior as a result of the White Memorandum, I take it. That's yes, what I'm hearing. And, and we are seeing different And you're behavior. seeing that. That's yeah. correct. I'm reminded of what Harry Truman was reported to have said as he contemplated President Eisenhower or General Eisenhower becoming President of the United States. He said the general will give an order around here and think it's been carried out, as it would be often in the military, and he'll find six months later nobody's done anything about it. So there is also that culture, and I was just curious how much the Pentagon had implemented in that three-year period, if you will. All right, sir. I, I don't know the answer to the actual implementation yeah. over those two or three years. Okay. Gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. Scarborough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, and it's interesting you bring up General Eisenhower. That reminds me of a story when I was reading a, a biography of, uh, of John Kennedy that's somewhat appropriate to uh, this hearing. They, they had then-President Eisenhower turning the White House over to John Kennedy. And... He was uh, trying to explain what was going on in the world and s sort of showed the perks of the White House, pressed a button and said, you press this button when you want to get a helicopter, pressed a button and then continued briefing uh, incoming President John Kennedy. John Kennedy was amazed that that helicopter came down a few minutes later and uh, the biographer commented that it was hard to get Eisenhower to, to get John Kennedy back on the subject of world affairs because he was so amazed at the access that he had to helicopters and to power. And uh, that shows that this problem uh, spans over generations, that sometimes uh, we, are, we are taken by some of the perks of the office. And it is, it is a, uh, has been a pattern of abuse uh, from administrations uh, uh, for, for, for several generations, Republican and Democrat alike. Let me ask you this, though. We, we, we've been talking about abuses. This committee, uh, Congressman Bartlett, has uh, made the recommendation of having an Office of Inspector General um, in the White House. My question to you is, if the White House uh, followed through on that recommendation and uh, had the Office of Inspector General, do you think some of the abuses that we're hearing about today uh, from from travel that appears to be excessive on the surface of not only the president, the first lady, but administration officials uh, would have been uh, toned down and, and possibly curbed uh, if if that office had been set up some time ago. Well, I think that this would uh, certainly give the perception of uh, of public disclosure. If there is a uh, uh, this kind of office in the White House, you would suspect that they would be. Uh, uh, they would be looking at things, and I think that, uh, uh, that there would be a great deal more accountability if there was the perception that uh, this was going to be looked at. I think in the past, and this was systemic for a number of years through all of the, uh, of, of the bureaucracy, that uh, you know, it just wasn't looked at, uh, and you could uh, do it, and uh, it was the customary thing to do, and nobody would care, which was the thing that kind of... Uh, uh, caught us in this helicopter incident that it was just uh, so inconceivable to to uh, most people in the real world that in the middle of the work week that you could take off work and take uh, the top two and by the way these were the top two presidential helicopters and go out to a golf outing and I stressed over and over then and I do it again now that the problem was not so much the the aides that did that the problem was the system that permitted them to do that and that's where we wanted the focus then, and I'm glad that's where you're putting the, uh, the focus. Now, I'd just like to ask the panel, if I might, uh, do you think that it would be appropriate to have public disclosure of the past records? Do you think that there would be a, uh, uh, obviously making sure that we don't have any national security problem uh, when it's a uh, military record, do you think it would be helpful to make public uh, some of the OMB and uh, GSA reports? that are now not made public? Do you have any problem with making those public? Do you think that, that this would help focus attention on this so that uh, we would have a more uh, rapid resolution of this, of this problem? What, uh, what's your response? I, I, I'll give my personal opinion. Yeah. I, I, having not seen either of those products, I don't know that what they would 
disclose that would be understandable to the public. Um, the uh, that was my next question. Is it formatted in such a way that the public would understand it, or would it need to be reformatted so that the public could, uh, could uh, understand what really had happened? I think the GSA witness might be able to help us with that, quite, that the answer that question. Uh, and just looking at the GAO report, Appendix 1, that lists the most frequent senior level travelers, the first person is General Lowe, Commander Air Combat Command, 414 flights over a, what, three-year period. That, that doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you what those flights were all about or whether um, it's meaningless. So if, you, if you're going to disclose, I, in my personal opinion, you've got to disclose fully so that people can make a value judgment. And all these flights are going to be subjective. Someone's going to make a decision on a go, no-go basis. I, th I think on that point, I'm, I'm told there were 12 cases somewhat like <coughs> General Ashey's case. Uh, did the Inspector General have access to those 12? Yes, sir, we did. Yeah. Uh, do you want to file them for the record? It, if you'd like them, yeah. we will do Let, that. Let's <coughs> take a look at them. Uh, I, I think the, uh, Mr. Bartlett raises a very good question. Obviously, if you're a general in charge of a major command, you ought to be out in the field seeing what's going on. And uh, General LeMay used to land at midnight on a strategic air command base just to see if they were awake. And uh, that does tune the organization up. And as you say, uh, you, the number of trips is not the question. <laughs> you know, I mean, if it's mission-oriented, and I must say, one thing that confuses me as I read this pile of stuff is the mission orientation and how mission is defined. <coughs> the military is very good at defining missions. Civilian agencies are very poor at defining missions. So how do we know when a trip is really mission oriented? Has that been looked at by GAO and in the case of the Pentagon by the Inspector General? Uh, sir, to, for the DOD, we have not done a systemic look at all this travel. Most of the time we're responding to individual complaints to the defense hotline when someone sees something on the ground and says, that's not right that that colonel got on that plane and did that, and they call in, or that's not right that that fellow got in a government vehicle and went to the supermarket. Thousands of calls in the defense hotline, those cases are looked at individually, um, and that's the way we've approached it in the past. We've not done a systemic audit. Uh, well, you're saying look. you're reactive. That's correct. Yes. And we were more uh, proactive don't you think in it's looking time at the big Inspector ticket. General did a systemic audit of Pentagon travel, especially since the Joint Chiefs have taken this action or proposed this action? Yes, sir. Um, yeah. With GAO looking at the, the way the Joint Chiefs came up with this number of 391 in the, in the background, we can certainly assist them in that and at the same time look at the way that these October and December memorandum have been implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it would be a good suggestion to look at the working papers as to how we got 391. Did a captain who's on the joint staff and would like to chair it someday just pick that out of the air, or is there actually some great sophisticated analysis that underlies that number? Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Scarborough. And, and continuing on the question regarding DOD use of travel, uh, I'm a member of the National Security Committee, and as a member, uh, we've heard time and time again uh, the, the committee staff or, or others saying if we want to take trips across the country to inspect military bases and installations, uh, that we could do that in such a way that would allow um, those pilots uh, that need time in the air to train. Uh, and, of course, we've been talking about the general and his cat uh, throughout the hearing this morning. Um, how much of that is legitimate, though, uh, even, even moving generals around and colonels around and others around, where you actually do have a situation where, um, where getting, transporting a general or transporting somebody else that needs to travel anyway uh, actually is, is being of benefit to the service because uh, you're helping the pilots with training time. That's a very good point, uh, Congressman Scarborough. The, the planes that we have, the Air Force has, and the other military services are going to fly anyway because those air crews have to remain, to a certain extent, re those air crews have to remain competent and within the required, they have to fly land, uh, land at installations or, or um, runways that are unfamiliar to them, those planes are going to go up. And we've got the active air crew, and we have the reserve air crew, the guard air crews. 
So there's a lot of people, there's a lot of redundancy that's built in in case we have a conflict and those people start um, being shot down. And we start, we've got an extra layer, of course, of military people to backfill. They have to remain current if they're gonna be any good. You can't wait till a contingency er erupts and then have to throw them into a training pipeline. So yes, those flights are gonna go up. Um, we have not studied whether or not uh, there, has, there have been abuse. Yes, we have investigated individual abuses, but we've not conducted a review of all of them to pick out um, subjectively what we consider to be abuses. But the fact of the matter is, uh, just playing devil's advocate for a moment here, not with you, but some of the questions regarding the general and, and other military trips, um, it would actually cost the federal government more money if, uh, let's say, we completely banned certain travel time because not only would you be paying for the, the, the training time for the pilots, but then you'd also be paying for the commercial air flight on top of the training time. And let's take the general, the general's trip, uh, right. uh, for instance. You don't know whether, whether during that trip the, the pilot th that flew him needed the training time or not, do you? We do. You do? Yes, sir. Did there he? was a double air crew on board that C-141, and as we determined that none of those pilots, co-pilots, engineers needed that training. They were current. Of course, the fact that they flew then bumped them up even more current, but they had just returned from, from Russia. Mm -hmm. They had already been up in the air and done everything they needed to do from a training perspective, and they were turned around in 24 hours to, to take care of this uh, dedicated flight for General Ashy. So that actually could be, that's something we could build on where we actually could uh, put a rule in place to say uh, that if you are going to be taking military personnel around generals or admirals or colonels or whatever, uh, that, that, they, that you would need pilots on board that actually need the time? Right. You know, the, this isn't something that's done in a vacuum. The Air Mobility Command, when there's cargo abroad or here in CONUS that needs to go abroad, they select air crews that are coming up on a list that need the, the training, whether it be active or reserve, and make them move the, the cargo. That moves the cargo, first of all, and also updates their, their training status. So the, there is a plan involved. We found that in this specific case, no one considered the plan. The plan was to get General Ashey back, um, and it was done in that culture. Well, it isn't, if I might interject a minute, uh, isn't the truth of the matter is we'd never have known about this if two retirees had not been refused uh, access to that trip. And it's standard practice in most military air bases that if you're a retiree or you're a reservist or you're even active duty, you want to catch a ride home, you sort of wait around to see if there's a plane going in your direction. Sometimes you wait three days sure. and you get on board on a space available basis. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. My, my final point, final question on this round uh, would be just asking you, you all if you, you do see a difference between, let's say, Hazel O'Leary using Madonna's chat uh, to, to go abroad or White House staff using a helicopter uh, to go golfing with, let's say, uh, some, some, of the, some of the problems we've seen, the military, uh, m military's use of planes, or do you, do you find the level of abuse uh, and waste to be as severe in the DOD as, let's say, some of the examples of, of Hazel O'Leary? Sir, once again, we've not done a comparative analysis um, or systemic review top to bottom to determine that we generally, the Department of Defense, do not use contract air. If, there, if a dedicated flight is needed, we've got our aircraft. Department of Energy did not have a flight that big. They could have come to the Air Force and received it and reimbursed the Air Force. Um, they chose to go the route that they did. So I don't have the answer to your question um, because they're the two different things, apples and oranges. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Are there any further questions by uh, members of the panel? Mr. Bartlett, do you have any further questions? I thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate uh, your expertise that you bring to this difficult problem. Our next uh, witness is Mr. Peter Zeidma, the Director of the Aircraft Management Division of the Federal Supply Service of the General Services Administration.
you would raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. The reporter will note that the witness affirmed. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Zeidman, and your written statement will be put in the record, and I think you know the procedure that... Uh, yes, sir, I'm sorry, sir. I, I uh, we'd uh, welcome uh, you to the hearing, and uh, as you know, the uh, procedure here is to put your written statement in the record, and if you would summarize it in five minutes, uh, then we can get to questions, and uh, don't worry, we won't uh, ask you to leave <laughs> until we have most of the story out. So please proceed. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I am Peter Zeidema, Director of the Aircraft Management Division for the General Services Administration. I appear before the subcommittee today to discuss GSA's roles and responsibilities in the management of federal government executive branch aircraft, particularly use of such aircraft for travel by senior federal officials. Federal civilian aircraft perform a variety of missions, including law enforcement, firefighting, search and rescue, humanitarian assistance, oceanographic, atmospheric, and aerospace research and development, land, fish, wildlife, and natural resources management, and passenger and cargo transport. GSA maintains a single coordinating office for the aircraft management. The responsibilities assigned to this office include recommending policies and numerous aircraft management areas, including procurement, cost accounting, operations, training, safety, and disposal, operating a centralized aircraft management information system, developing other generic aircraft uh, management systems and tools, providing training and technical assistance, collecting aircraft management data, preparing aircraft management reports, and maintaining an interagency aviation working group to advise GSA. And regarding the last item, uh, since 1989, GSA has chaired and administered the Interagency Committee for Aviation Policy, and that's known as ICAP. And the ICAP consists of senior representatives from all federal departments and agencies with aircraft programs. And now I'll briefly discuss uh, two areas, the Federal Aviation Management Information System and the use of federal aircraft for transportation of passengers. First, the Federal Aviation Management Information System and it's known by the acronym FAMOUS. Uh, the FAMOUS contains an abundance of information, including data on federal civilian agency. This excludes Department of Defense and the areas I'm about to talk about. Uh, data on federal civilian agency, aircraft inventories, operating costs, and flight hours, and operating costs for flight hours for contract charter and rental aircraft. And federal civilian departments and agencies must report such data annually to GSA uh, by January 15th for the preceding fiscal year. In this area, GSA checks the reported data against previous GSA famous data, GSA property management records, and FAA aircraft registry. And after GSA reconciles any discrepancies with applicable civilian departments and agencies, we publish a consolidate, consolidated annual report and deliver it to OMB. And upon request, GSA also provides this report to others, including inspectors general, uh, GAO, the public, Congress, and the media. And according to the last report, the fiscal year 1994 famous report, federal civ civilian aircraft fleet consisted of 1,596 aircraft with annual, annual operating costs of $883 million. Contract charter and rental aircraft accounted for additional annual operating costs of $204 million. I know you cited these, you know, in your opening statement. I just make the point that these are not all involved in passenger transport. They cover a variety of missions that I uh, talked about before. Now I'll turn to use of federal aircraft for travel by senior officials. In general, Federal aircraft can be used only for official purposes, and official purposes include performing agency mission activities like firefighting, search and rescue, research and development, uh, used for meeting the scheduling communications or security needs of certain designated officials, and supporting official travel on agency bus business. Official travel on federal aircraft is authorized only when commercial airline and other aircraft service, including charter, is not reasonably available 
the cost of using a federal aircraft is not more than commercial airline or other aircraft service, or a federal aircraft is in use primarily for mission requirements and official travel is secondary. Uh, space available travel on federal aircraft may also be authorized if the aircraft is in primary use for official purposes and the space available travel does not require a larger aircraft or results in no or only minor additional costs and appropriate reimbursement is provided. All travel on federal aircraft must be approved uh, by the department or agency head or officials designated by the department or agency head and a cost comparison must be performed uh, for approval on the basis that the cost of using a federal aircraft is not more than commercial airline or other aircraft service. Now I'll talk about uh, the senior federal travel reports. OMB Circular Number A-126 initially established a requirement to report non-mission travel on federal aircraft by senior federal officials, dependents, and non-federal travelers. And the circular defines senior federal officials as executive branch employees, except for active military officers who are paid at or above the minimum uh, SES salary level. And this requirement went into effect in fiscal year 1993. Subsequently, uh, the Presidential Memorandum and OMB Bulletin Number 93-11 established an additional requirement to report all travel. This would include both mission and non-mission by senior executive branch officials on federal aircraft. And senior executive branch officials uh, were defined in the memorandum and OMB bulletin as presidential appointees who are subject to Senate confirmation and all civilian employees of the executive office of the president. Uh, this requirement went into effect in fiscal year 1994. And we, GSA, consolidated these requirements in a regulation. GSA compiles a consolidated semi-annual senior federal travel report and provides it to OMB. And upon request, GSA also provides the report to others, including IGs, GAO, the public, Congress, and the media. I'll note that exemptions to the reporting requirements include travel on aircraft in use by or in support of the president or vice president and travel by active duty military officers. I'll conclude by saying that I appreciate the opportunity to provide clarification or further details, and I look forward to your questions. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, you note uh, in your testimony uh, that uh, you talked about the Senior Federal Travel Report, which is uh, a semi-annual report, and uh, that uh, you make that available to the public and the media upon request. Uh, how many times this last year have you had such requests and uh, have you had a chance to respond to all of them and what, I mean, is there much volume and interest in this area? In the past year, more than usual, and I anticipated that question and I looked it up, there are 18, uh, primarily to uh, IGs, GAO, Congress, and the media. 18 requests? 18, and uh, I think the highest before then was about seven. And that's asking about specific cases of travel or? No, that they want reports, all of them, going back, you know, in most cases, all the way back to fiscal year 1993. I see. Now, what sort of information do they get out of that report? And is the report designed along the line that has been discussed here so you really know what's going on and not buried somewhere just in destination? Uh, they're getting better. The early reports. Uh, we would get submissions in a variety of formats. We would get them on diskette in an automated format for our famous system. Uh, very few at first. Uh, we get them on uh, senior federal travel forms. We add a large volume of those and we get them in custom uh, design. So early on it was very difficult uh, to, you know, design a report uh, that was user friendly. Uh, for the last uh, series of senior federal travel reports, the last one, we decided that we just had to take the time to punch the data into our famous system uh, so that it would be more readable. And, and we're, we're still redesigning the format. On the form, do you ask the basic question, is this travel mission oriented? Oh, yes, that's one of the elements. Okay. You know, mission. Uh, Official travel required use. Yeah. 
Just in your review of these forms, since you're really the person on top of it more than anybody else in the government, uh, are they all mission-oriented when they file, or is there another category where this is a non-mission-oriented trip? Uh, well, they're filed under basically three categories, mission, required use, or official travel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't, you know, I couldn't tell you what the percentage, the percentages are. Do the, uh, on the mission uh, oriented, do you think that is a clearly defined matter so one knows what that means when they check that box? What's your feeling, your well, gut it, instinct? It is to me. I'm not sure it would be to, uh, you know, to others. It, it is a matter of interpretation. Sure. And uh, do you feel there's confusion on that in the various agencies? I, I would suspect so. What could be done but to sort of eliminate the confusion and give that question a little more focus so you have a way to judge uh, whether this trip is necessary well, and the urgency. Track. I'm sorry. And the urgency of the trip. That's one excuse, I'm assuming, for not going commercial in some cases that, gee, we've got to get out there. That's, well, that's understandable. If that's mission-oriented and you've got an earthquake or a fire or whatnot, you want to be there and you want to be there with your staff and you want to help the taxpayers and the customers that pay the bills. Yes, sir, and that, in my mind, would be, would be a mission. Sure. Uh, on other travel, if commercial service is unavailable, you know, within 24 hours, a reasonable amount of time, or there are some other exigencies, then mm -hmm. you can also go on government aircraft for the policy. If you could wave a wand and redesign the policy, since you're at the receiving end of one aspect of this policy, what would you do to improve the situation? given what you've heard here today? Well, I, I think the policy is, is fairly clear. And I know I just said that uh, there is room for interpretation on the missions. Uh, but missions are uh, defined, and I define some of them, but they are a matter of interpretation. I, I think the real problem is in uh, communications, controls, and systems. And people have talked about communications here with a focus on the outside, people you know, exercising some oversight, getting information. Um, I'm talking about a different kind of communications, really communications uh, within the agencies from the people who, who know the policies and procedures, and then clearly communicating them up the line to the senior federal officials uh, so that they're aware, and then putting controls in place you know, so that uh, there are no abuses of the system. Yeah. So certainly one major role in an agency is to have a g training policy and an orientation policy when people come into the agency of uh, whether they come under that policy or not, just a matter of uh, when does one do something and under what circumstances it's in the public interest. Because anything we do as a public servant, be we in the legislative branch, judicial branch, or executive branch, uh, is judged by another standard than what you have in the private sector, let's say, or the nonprofit sector. So uh, how would you do that? Is it, do you think there's a lack of proper orientation as you grapple with these reports that are headed in your direction? Uh, and we need to get better personnel practices in the agency? Certainly, I would think you can't abide by a policy if you don't know it exists and you don't know what the parameters are. Yeah. Well, that would certainly be helpful. I think that the people in aircraft management within the agencies need to be communicating with the people responsible for overall travel. And that way, make them aware of the policies for travel on aircraft management. Now, do you know in GSA at what level the various forms that are sent to you have cleared in these agencies? Do we have that laid out somewhere? Who's doing what in what agency? No, we have obviously points of contact that we work with, and we know the levels, you know, at that agency, how they're cleared within their agencies. I, I wouldn't know. Yeah, because I, I think that's an important point. I think staff ought to follow up with the General Accounting Office and uh, the appropriate uh, OMB, uh, Office of Budget and Man uh, Management Offices, uh, Management and Budget, uh, to find out what level are we talking about the clearance. Because when you get uh, uh, 
you need clear policies, number one, in this area. You need a level of clearance that can enforce a no and not have to supinely uh, submit to every request that comes in the direction of that person, where the secretary either appoints an assistant or somebody that uh, has the position. And then you need what's been said by everybody, members of the panel, Mr. Bartlett of Maryland, and so forth. You need some disclosure system. Now, you're the disclosure system, in a sense. Then the question is, is the report make any sense? So if the average citizen or reporter or whoever, member of Congress, asked for them, they could tell, did this trip make any sense? We can cover all sorts of things. I notice conferences by the agency really don't have to be uh, reported on. But if you go to another conference not sponsored by the agency, that has to be reported on. That sort of struck me as with a certain amount of bemusement. Uh, you know, the agency conferences can be as unnecessary as the non-agency conferences. But that's a judgment call. And, you know, how do you get that process for people to think about it before they do it is really what we're after. I'm sorry, could you... How do you get a process that people think about what they're doing before they do it. And that's what really this process is. And that reporting process that you're at the recipient end of was designed to be helpful in that regard. I take it from your answers, you're not particularly convinced that type of report meets the needs that everybody's been talking about here. Where do you find abuse in the executive travel area? And that's why I'm interested in your opinion, because you're on the recipient end of this, and most of us aren't. Mm -hmm. so question, is the question based on the reports? Yeah, or do other, I find in other words, these? when you look at those reports, do they make any sense to you, or do you say, hey, we ought to redesign this thing? Mm -hmm. How do you I, feel? Um, it's a quandary because uh, we collect a lot of data. Right. And then it's a matter of what we want to display, and it, it seems that every time we redesign the report, we leave out data that people want to know about. So to have a, you know, a summary report is, is kind of difficult to do. Uh, where I see problem areas in the report, you touched on one, uh, is uh, mission. You know, is it a mission flight? Uh, that's the agency call. They may think it's a mission flight. Others may think that it's not a mission flight. It's not a mission of, of the agency. Other areas, uh, I would guess, would be in the cost. Uh, the uh, cost comparison. Um, now, cost comparisons are only required when it's other official travel. So they're not going to be in there if it's a mission or required use. Um, and, you know, how do they come up with those cost comparisons? And sometimes they're not there at all, even though they should be. Sometimes, uh, you know, the numbers look uh, questionable. Okay. When they're not there at all, do you ship that back to the agency? Uh, no, we're not, we're not manned or, or staffed to perform an audit function, but I, I can tell you that, as I mentioned before, we've given these reports to, uh, well, IG and GAO has been resident in, in GSA since I've been there two years and long before, uh, and they've been resident in the agencies as well, looking at these reports, and, you know, I presume they're, they're asking those kind of questions, which, which is helpful. If what they're going to do is say, you know, GSA, you should be auditing these reports. Uh, we're simply not uh, staffed or funded to do that. To give do that me, function. give me a feeling on this. How many reports come in a day? Is, are they just oh. automatically come in within a certain period, or how does this work from the agencies? Uh, no, they come in uh, uh, for the first half of the fiscal year which would be from October 1st to March 31st, we require that they submit them by May 31st. Okay, so, so they, an, they Octo come in. an October 1st trip taken mm -hmm. within an agency mm -hmm. does not appear at GSA until possibly May of the next year. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So it's an eight-month lag. Yes, sir. So even if someone asked for the information, they had a suspicion or something, GSA is not the place to find those data you know, reporting to GSA yeah. uh, accurate information. And, and 
I was going to say timely, but timely in my mind means by May 31st. <laughs> let, let me ask staff, has the General Accounting Office looked at that aspect so far where they go into GSA, take a sample of the reports that have been filed under the semi-annual rule, and said, does this make any sense? And you're saying GSA doesn't have either the personnel assigned or whatever to go over there and say, hey, why didn't they fill in the commercial cost comparison data? In which case you ship it back and say, hey, folks, fill out the form before you send it to us. This kind of thing. I mean, have they done any study such as that? In conversations I've had with GAO, uh, I guess over the last, I guess, four months or so, I spoke to them specifically about this one we thought this might be coming up at an earlier date. They had not looked into this at all, and they were looking forward to this hearing now. Well, I, I think we ought to work out between staff, GAO, myself, we ought to work out a study to say, hey, what does this stuff show us? If it shows us nothing, so what? I mean, we've got a reporting system that A, is not timely, B, is not really monitored in the report. It's an illusion of action, and that's what concerns me. That's why I'm asking for your advice, because you're the only one that's seeing all this stuff or has a chance to, mm -hmm. you know, dip through a day's input. But the day's input isn't daily. The day's input, as long as you make it, folks, by May, if you did it, the trip on October 1st, you're okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we know that agencies that don't even file reports? Uh, there may be some. We require a negative report. Uh, initially, we did not. But yeah. You know, we saw that problem. How would we know? Yeah. Uh, well, so we, we ought to look. What we ought to do is reports. have GS, uh, GAO look at the flight logs on some of the obvious means of transport and say, okay, where's the matching paper? Mm -hmm. I mean, as an as an executive, most of my life before I came here, I worry about a lot of paper. But when you got a problem area, you have to deal with it somehow. Now, you've heard a lot of this testimony. Forget your own specific responsibility. You're living with this problem in part. What would you do if you wanted to turn this lack of a cost-conscious culture in for some people? I mean, 99% are doing the right thing, probably. But the 1% we have to deal with, what would you do to solve the problem? I'd Again, I agree with what was said here about public disclosure. Uh, and I would go back to my previous answer on communi internal communications controls. And right. I don't think that I talked about the third thing, were systems. Yeah. I think you have to have systems where you can collect the data in real time and, and report it if, right. if required. And would that be the main point you'd make on the systems, that you need a much more rapid response system there? You have to have a system that that collects the data, first of all, right? Uh, in, in real time. Yeah. Uh, well, let's translate then, for the average you, person. When you say you need a system that collects the data in real time, what's your definition of real time? Uh, right after the flight. Okay. In other words, you'd file it either before or after the flight. Seems to me to get clearance at the agency to start with, you've got a before situation. Mm-hmm. Then it sits around, whatever decision they made. Yeah. And uh, so are you saying that we ought to get the slip on which that agency made that judgment? That ought to be the report form. Um, yeah, and uh, something's coming to my mind that I think might possibly be a solution to this dilemma. I, I don't know if you've heard of the Joint Aviation Logistics Information System. I haven't. It's uh, one of those agency functions that I have not explored. Go ahead and tell me about it. Well, this is, uh, and again, uh, uh, this is something the DOD, I understand, is looking at to put all their OSA aircraft on that. And it's a system where you put in a, as I understand it, you put in a, a flight request. It aggregates the flight requests. Um, you s schedule aircraft. You run a, uh, a cost comparison. Uh, you make sure that it's an authorized flight. Then you actually uh, perform the flight, come back, do a, an after action, or get a post record of the flight so that you can check um, you know, whether or not you, you plan the mission, but then you put in what the changes were. For instance, if you didn't go to the destinations that you planned or you spent more ground time, whatever. 
And uh, as I understand it, this system would also uh, answer the mail for the A126 reports. So it would be, you know, essentially available uh, mm -hmm. right after flight completion or soon right after that. Mm -hmm. And GSA has worked on a, an earlier version of this. That's why I have some familiarity with it. Uh, we have a system that, that we feel fielded called a demand logistics management system, which is a, a lower end version, mm -hmm. you know, of the uh, joint aviation logistics information system. We worked, uh, and we are watching the, uh, you know, what DOD is doing. Our system is kind of in prototype operational test mm -hmm. right now. Some agencies are using it, and we're real interested in seeing, you know, what DOD's uh, uh, experience mm -hmm. with it is going to be. Well, that's very helpful. Uh, does GSA have the authority to implement that in carrying out their responsibilities, or would it be OMB that has to make that decision, the Office of Management and Budget? Well, I, you know, I'd have to go back and, uh, uh, as I recall, what the policy and the regulation says, GSA can uh, develop systems, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, but, but we can't enforce them. I mean, we can't impose them on the agencies. Uh, you can't on behalf of the president? Because it's based on a presidential directive he signed within a month of taking the oath. And then OMB acted and GSA acted, putting out appropriate documents. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me if the president wanted to solve the problem, and he said he did, the agencies ought to be figuring out ways to carry out the presidential order. It wasn't an executive order. It was a directive, I would guess, to, as I remember reading it, to the a ex heads of executive agencies. And it just, I would think that would, whatever GSA would do in this area would be immensely helpful in seeing that the President's desires in this area are fulfilled. Sir, we're, we're big advocates of, of, of this system, these systems. I yield to the gentleman from Virginia. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just a, c a couple quick questions. If you were to put all this information uh, that you have, your database and all your modules online, uh, do you th w w would that be, do you think, help? Uh, is, it, is it doable, first of all? Do you think that would be helpful to the process? Um, we are doing that now. Uh, it's not, uh, is, it is it done yet? No, it's not done yet. We've just we've You had just 18 requests that. last year, basically, but putting it online would make it more available than anybody who wanted to look at it. Probably, yes. uh, okay. Yes. Uh, and that would be useful. Uh, again, I imagine we'd get... Uh, you know, we still have to fix the problem of how to present the data so that people could understand it. Sure. You know, certainly uh, we can't, uh, the way things stand now, uh, man a, uh, a helpline to explain, uh, explain these reports. Do you have, and I don't know if, if the Chairman asked this or not, is there any mechanism now to assure the accuracy of the information in the reports? And by that, I mean, do you just take the official's word or do you do many audits on what is reported to you? Or is your staff just so limited that's kind of impossible? We, we look at obvious things, but uh, again, we don't uh, make any judgments on things like mission or cost comparisons. Uh, okay. You know, we do have some back and forth with the agencies. Um, but I guess I have a question. If you were to review a sample of reports every six months, uh, publish, do you publish the reports of those reports after you've gone back? Do we you, publish? You come back and you do some review, you're saying. There is some, some review uh, to, in terms of uh, do you... Um, uh, do you publish those? Are those published or those kept internally? The results and uh, analysis. Yeah, the results of your reviews, yeah. No, we just publish the reports. Okay. And we, you know, we don't do uh, an analysis. As, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we get plenty of help from IG, GAO, Fine. media, yeah. Congress. Thanks. Let me ask a question. This committee recently held a hearing on the White House Travel Office. Um, where we learned of uh, new activities that the President's friend, Hollywood producer Harry Thomason, uh, were, was involved in. I'm sure you read about uh, some of that in the media. These activities included seeking GSA contracts through the Interagency Committee on Aviation Policy, also known as ICAP. Uh, do you know if Mr. Thomason or his partner, Darnell Martins, ever had any contacts uh, with your office? Uh. Mr. Martins, this was before I was, I was there, uh, Mr. Martins had a conversation with a member of my staff. Uh, it wasn't about a contract, it was general information, as I understand it, about what we do. Do you know who on your staff he talked to at that? Larry Godwin. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Just a, a couple other questions. Um, 
one of, on the charts we were given, uh, uh, Dan uh, Golden, who is the head of NASA, took a trip on May 11, 1994. It is listed on the chart as from DCA to DCA. Do you know where he went uh, and uh, why the, he wouldn't ordinarily have reported the destination instead of just the round trip? Mm -hmm. No, I, I Any don't. Any more knowledge of that flight or that's just a... We, 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 we see those from time to time and it's, uh, you know, again, we don't, uh, we don't audit it. Uh, I would assume that he made a quick stop somewhere and, and flew right back to Washington. It was the same day. All right, let me just uh, ask. I, 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 go you ahead. Know, knowing from the GAO report, you know, they showed frequent where people go most frequently. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we know uh, from the senior uh, Federal Travel Bureau report that Mr. Golden was making a speech somewhere. Don't know where. Uh, however, the report lists that Mr. Golden's trip, uh, the, 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 the trip cost the government $9,570. Is that, is, that, is that accurate as far as you know? Uh, is that a typo it, or it, it, one flight? It looks high, but I think it would depend on the, uh, the type of aircraft that they were operating and who else was on the aircraft. So that could conceivably... It, it, that would be supposedly it's, a, it's an allocated cost for the uh, variable cost of using that aircraft for that trip. So, so, so from, it might be that high. To fly from point A to point B and back again, $9,570. Well, I thought we'd have to know more specifics than that. All right, I just that would raise a flag to me if I were looking at it. And if, if you have any more information, I'm sure we'd appreciate uh, seeing that. that. That's all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman very much. Uh, I want the staff to work with GSA in putting into the record maybe ten different examples. At this point, these are the reports that your office submits, each one relating to a different agency. And uh, I just happened to be glancing at the one on the Department of State. I think we need to show a sample of how we do this now. And uh, certainly I think your suggestions are very worthwhile in terms of uh, how we might approach it on a total system basis and look at all aspects of it. But uh, we ought to just throw in a few pages. And staff will follow up with you and our first panel on some more questions that are more detailed. Uh, if the gentleman from Virginia doesn't have any more questions, I would just say it seems to me what I noted a few moments ago, we're talking about the need for clear policy, and I think you put it very well. Uh, the level of clearance that uh, can say no and make it stick and not have to say yes when that person comes through the door. Certainly cabinet officers travel, and the O'Leary situation is a good example. I haven't mentioned it, but I'll mention it just in passing. That ought to be Chief of Staff at the White House travel. Uh, I mean, Chief of Staff Panetta ought to be signing off on that. And I gather he is more and more, or certainly on the White House portion, he's signing off. And uh, that stuff causes presidents more problems than anything else you can think about. And so it becomes a political judgment for high-level officials such as that, and the example my colleague from Virginia raised. And then, obviously, the disclosure situation. Uh, would uh, help as uh, Mr. Bartlett and Mr. Scarborough and uh, Mr. Davis and myself have all agreed. So we thank you very much for coming, and we will be sending you some questions. would appreciate some answers. With that, uh, I want to thank the uh, people that have uh, been involved in this hearing. Uh, we can uh, start with our uh, uh, majority staff, uh, Russell George, the staff director and counsel. Uh, Harrison Fox, who was uh, sitting beside me at the first panel, the uh, expert on the e executive side, and Counsel Ned, who's professional staff member, sitting with me on the GSA. He's read all these reports, you see, so uh, he's a fast reader. And Andrew Richardson, the subcommittee clerk, and then our friends on the minority staff, uh, Miles Romney, the counsel, and Sherry Branson, professional staff member. And our official reporter today is Jan Del Monte. Thank you all. We appreciate the work that went into the hearing. The House has been in a series of recesses since last Friday while budget negotiations continue. The House plans to meet tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. No legislative business is scheduled, but members may speak for up to an hour on any subject. 
You can watch live coverage of the House here on C-SPAN. Tonight at 8 on American Perspectives, a speech by Pulitzer Prize-winning author Studs Terkel. He talks about his recent book, Coming of Age, The Story of Our Century by Those Who Lived It. Economist John Kenneth Galbraith also speaks of the event, which was held recently at Harvard University. For them, 